Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and we're back with episode 9, I believe, of Ask GN. More good questions this week from the community. And as always, if you have questions, post them in the comments below. I'll check this video first when compiling questions for the next episode. So we're going to start right away with some CPU questions. This one is, it's more of a comment really from Simon White, but I wanted to address it because this is in reply to something we were talking about in the previous video about the G3258, 860K, i3s, things like that. So Simon says, <laughs> get a Pentium G3258 and the 390, not the 860K or the i5, uh, then upgrade the CPU later to an i5 or i7, since GPU is more important in most games. I The GPU is pretty important in games, but I'm not sure I entirely... Uh, I'm not sure I would necessarily take that route, depending on what you're doing. So here's the problem with the G3258. It's a really good CPU. It does single-threaded things very well, and it overclocks like a champion. It's it's a good CPU, and I would definitely buy it for some builds. But the G3258 really suffers in games like GTA, and you won't see that in just average FPS benchmarks. It'll look better than the 860K when you're benchmarking for average FPS. So you have to look at the 1% and 0.1% lows, which is what we do when you're testing these games. Look at the frame times because the G3258 really starts to struggle with heavily multi-threaded games like GTA 5 and things of that nature. Total War games are heavily multi-threaded. So the 3258 is good, but if you're playing GTA 5, and I, I have this in some benchmarks on the 7870K, the AMD APU, so you can check that review out if you're curious, but... Uh, in GTA 5, the G3258 will get a higher average FPS, and going from memory here, I think it was about 75 FPS average with a 980 Ti on high slash ultra settings. And the 760K I tested, the previous version of the 860K, was I believe about 65 FPS average. It was, it was something about a 10 FPS average difference between the two with the 3258 leading. So that makes the 3258 sound like a better CPU, but... If you look at the 1% lows and 0.1% lows, the 3258 was getting 4 or something like it, some single digit number, 4 or 6 FPS for the lows with the same setup, where the 760K was running almost perfectly fine, I can't remember, but I th it was around 30 or above 30 FPS for the lows. So that happens because the 3258 gets hammered for the thread count, it just it can't survive once you start spawning more threads. And that's, uh, Crytek games will do a lot of that. They spawn a render thread, a physics thread, and they spawn a game logic thread, things like that. So it, it starts building threads, and CryEngine, specifically the newer ones, can do up to eight threads. And if you're customizing, like the Star Citizen team is, then it's, it's really just dependent on the developer at that point. So the 3258 does not like that scenario. And it won't show that in average FPS necessarily, but it will definitely show it in the lows. And that translates to more noticeable dips, drops, and loss in frames and frame rate. So if you're hitting a 4 FPS 0.1% low, yeah, you're seeing that 0.1% of the time. But that means that every maybe couple seconds to 20, 30 seconds max, you're going to see some kind of hit where your game just, it looks like it stutters, like there's a pause of a very brief period of time, but it's enough to interrupt immersion to get frustrating mechanically. And that's where something like the 3258 is not something I would recommend. And I would recommend, uh, I guess, if my only option is an 860K, I would recommend the 860K in that scenario. But if you're going for more single and dual threaded games, yeah, the 3258 tends to outperform just because games like frequency more than architecture a lot of the time. And the 3258 can push a very high frequency so, especially with overclocking. Now, the the other part that is up for question, and I talked about this in the last video, is do you buy a better GPU or a better CPU? And I, I already said this, but I buy a better CPU and motherboard, and then I upgrade the GPU later if I have to, because I want a stable platform that doesn't change. I don't want to change my OS. And yeah, Windows 10 will look like it's more tolerant with a motherboard or platform shift, as it's called, if you shift the platform, motherboard, and CPU, Windows 10 will survive the transfer, most most likely anyway, or most of the time, at least if you're staying within Intel or within AMD. But 
it's still gonna have a ton of orphaned drivers, a lot of registry entries that are unclean, and you're gonna have to install more stuff, and it mess it messes the OS up in terms of its cleanliness, and that becomes sort of a burden as the system ages. So that's my that's my thinking on it. Uh, certainly, the GPU is generally more important for frame rate, so in that regard, yeah, it's it's a good idea to get a good GPU, but. Uh, that's kind of where I am with that topic. Obviously, it depends on what you want to do. <clears throat> Next question is from someone who signed off as Confused Gamer, and they said, I have a question about GPUs that confuse me a lot lately. I want some clear answers. And said, I found out that less powerful GPUs are essentially broken versions of the more powerful GPUs. For example, 980 has a GPU that just turned out to be a better uh, turned out better than the 970 GPU while trying to create the 980 Ti. Is it true? If it is, how do they get GPUs with similar performance when there's so much chance tied to creating one? Uh, so I, I think I understand this question. It's definitely a little more than chance creating one. It's it's very scientific. They use uh, going forward, ion cannons will be used to make CPUs because the process is getting so small. So with the fab process of 8 nanometers, stuff like that, you're, there's a process technology shift that will be impressive and scientific and not necessarily chance, but the part that it is chance is the binning process. So there's a binning process, it's called, with any silicon, GPUs, CPUs, flash modules on SSDs, RAM, and all of that stuff. And when we say bin, it basically means that the manufacturer or the AIB, the add-on board provider, will request or actively bin for chips that perform to a certain degree. So the best example is overclocking cards. If you buy an overclocking 980 Ti or R9 390X or whatever, the, the general difference here is going to be the chip. So the chip in those instances was binned out actively because it was able to tolerate a higher frequency, or a higher voltage, or something of that degree. It was it was more tolerant of the additional power force through it and the higher frequencies, and it was more stable. And so that was selected from the, we'll just pretend it's a conveyor belt, right? Like an assembly process. Say, say you've got a conveyor belt of chips. They test those chips as they come through, pull off the good ones, put it in this pile, pull off the average ones, put it in that pile, pull out the bad ones and throw them out or bin them down to a lower GPU spec. And that's where you sometimes get cards that have the same physical GPU, the same chip, but maybe have some features disabled. That happens with CPUs as well. And that's actually the 860K, 760K, things like that. They exist because the IGP is disabled on the APU. The graphics component is disabled. Now, the part of that is creating a new CPU, SKU, and part of it is, well, maybe the IGP was actually bad. So we don't we're, we don't want to throw away a good CPU, and it's all in one package. So we're just going to disable the IGP and, and repackage it and sell it as something else. So that's a, a good way to reuse components for these manufacturers, and it's a good way to create new SKUs at different price points and things like that. The uh, part I think that this is getting at is the GPUs themselves. So if you look at specs for... GPUs, what you're going to find, especially on our website, is the the specs sheet will list GPU, and it'll say, in the case of NVIDIA, GM200, GM204, GM206, and those are the Titan X slash 980Ti, 980, stuff like that, and as you get towards the GM206, it's the 960. So that is the actual GPU. The, the words 960, GTX 960, or a GTX 980 or R9 390X, that is not actually the GPU. That's the video card that's been branded and packaged with a GPU that is often labeled as GM200 something, if it's Maxwell, or Fiji, or Tonga, if it's AMD stuff. So that's the, the physical GPU. You look at the spec sheet, you'll see that, and that's what is being binned out. Sometimes you'll see the same chip, the same GPU, GM200 is in a few cards. You'll see it in a few cards, and the way they differentiate it is by enabling, disabling, or adding features depending on when the device was created. There might be new features that came about, or if there was some sort of binning process, or just to, to make another SKU, and they'll 
change the core count and things like that. Uh, so it's it's not like they're taking features away from a higher end GPU. It's just that it's it's all by design for the most part. I don't know if that helps, but do let me know if you have more questions about that because it is an interesting topic to talk about. The next question is from Syncver2 who says, is AMD's uh, SVR, would, I, I think you're talking about the, um, the DSR equivalent from AMD, which is VSR, that's it, VSR, virtual super resolution. Is AMD's VSR really worth using on a 1080p monitor why can't crossfire cards memory go into dual channel mo mode so you can use both cards instead of the both cards memory instead of the first? Um, the first question: VSR and DSR will have almost a lossless uh, conversion of the resolution. So basically, what's happening is the game is rendering out the higher resolution. So if it's if you're using VSR or DSR to go 4K on 1080 it will render 4K and then it, it downsamples it, it scales it down to fit your screen. So what that does is it packs more pixels, basically. It creates the appearance of greater pixel density and depth in the 1080p display when you're taking that 4K resolution and downsampling it. So that assists in things like aliasing, it helps get rid of some of that. It assists in general quality or apparent quality of textures by looking like there's a greater attention to detail in the textures by nature of a higher pixel density per, you know, per screen square inch or something like that. So is it worth it? Uh, it is a big performance impact to do any kind of super sizing because you're, if you're going to 1440 or 4K, it will render at almost the exact requirement of 1440 and 4K if you had a real monitor at that resolution. There's maybe a 1% overhead, but that's around where it is. So you'll take a big performance hit if you have a high-end dual or single GPU setup and you're not really using the extra frames for something. If you're playing a game where you get 100 FPS and you don't have a 120, 144 hertz monitor, sure, it could be worth it. Why not? But uh, generally, I don't use it just because it's, it's extra, a big extra impact to frame rate in exchange for not necessarily a whole lot. Now, it is impressive visually in some games, but it's there's so many other things I would turn on instead. So just it kind of depends on the game, but generally you're not going to see a massive difference in most games. In some games like GTA, you'll see a pixel density benefit to the texture, apparent texture resolution. I'm using the word apparent very intentionally here. And that might be worth it, but you really just have to try to see Generally, though, I, I don't use it. Uh, next question, John Waco. Steve, I have a question for you. Can you please explain which BIOS settings should be enabled or disabled when stress testing a CPU overclock? That's a very good question. Which BIOS settings should be enabled or disabled for regular PC usage, gaming, and whatnot after stress testing? So this falls into the test methodology, which we do a lot of. For stress testing overclocks, you generally want to leave turbo boost on and you can force it to remain on if you really want to be to be sure uh, that will make sure that if turbo boost is being used depending on the the how extreme your overclock is if it's if it's really high then it's not going to be used because it'll be running higher um natively but you want to leave that set to a higher setting or a turbo boost set to on so that you can actually force the frequency to be its highest rated frequency, do that before your overclock, do it after your overclock, see if it crashes because if it's off and then you start playing a game and maybe uh, Turbo Boost ticks on and it wasn't ticking on during your stress test, then that will cause problems potentially. So you should use Prime 95 or something similar for stressing the CPU 100% load. That's, that's what we use. Uh, it's debatable sometimes how good that is in the real world, but generally it will overstress the, the CPU to the point where you should root out any failures or shortcomings in your overclock. So use Prime95 and you'll want to disable all of the power saving features. That's something we do. Intel in particular has a ton of power saving features. There's C states, they're called. Uh, so there's C6, C7, states like that. And those impact things like the uh, active idle there's something called s0ix it's written which is active idle 
And that power state, S0, is, it means the system's on, as opposed to something like S4, which means it's in hibernate, or S3, which means it's in sleep. So S0IX, active idle, is something you don't want on when you're, you're burning in your CPU. Now, it shouldn't turn on anyway, because by design, it is not made to turn on active idle when you're under 100% load, but it's good practice to disable that just to be safe. So disable power saving features, Turbo, you probably want on for the pre-overclock burn-in to make sure the CPU is good to begin with. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else off the top of my head, I think that's mostly it. You'll want to pay attention to fan speeds too. Make sure smart fan control is on for the CPU fan especially and not just set to silent or something like that because you can do that through the motherboard as well. Now in terms of what should be enabled or disabled, excuse me, uh, during normal PC usage, the for gaming, you, I, don't, I would probably leave it the same, honestly. I'd probably leave all the C states off, but that's just me. Now, if you're doing normal usage, you can definitely get away with re-enabling all those power saving states. You'll save a couple watts here and there, especially when your CPU is active idle, which means that you're using the computer, but it's, it doesn't need the CPU this exact instant in time, so it'll clock it down. Uh, and you'll see that reflected in CPU Z or something where you can see the clock rate. You'll actually see the clock rate fall, it'll plummet to a couple hundred megahertz. So that is a good thing. It cuts off power consumption quite a bit. So you might want those back on, especially if you're actually using it regularly, not using it as a render machine or something like that. If you're using this as a production work machine where it needs to be extremely accurate and kind of ready to go all the time, then I would just leave those disabled. But uh, that should cover the basics for burn-in and overclocking. If there's anything else I'm forgetting that's important, I'll, I'll do another video about it. And just we'll just talk specifically about CPU overclocking because that's a cool topic to do too. Last one here. Nishant says, I'd like to know what's your opinion on developers making huge over six to seven gigabyte downloads from Steam necessary even when you can buy the physical, I see where this is going, physical copy of the game because I have a digital copy of MGS5, came with a 960, but I have slow internet connection and can't download it. Um, and then Bethesda, this is what Nishant's talking about, I guess. Bethesda recently announced that you can buy Fallout 4 on PC, you can buy a disc, but it doesn't actually contain the whole game, and that is an attempt at thwarting piracy. First of all, that's not gonna work. Uh, so I, it, it's, I don't know. It, just, it seems kind of like a wasted effort, but uh, it's, that's not going to stop pirates, and we all know that, and they know that, so I, it just doesn't really seem... I guess it's also on DVD, and maybe they didn't want to do like a Blu-ray or a dual-layer DVD or something like that, reduced cost, I guess, so maybe that's a reason. But in, in terms of my opinion, um, yeah, I used to, a long time ago, really hate Steam. It's not necessarily true now. I'm a little afraid of it, but I don't hate it. And the reason that I hated Steam was because I was worried that Valve, which was a much smaller company back then, could go under and all my games would be gone forever. And then I'd wished I had physical discs instead. Now things are different. Now everything goes through Steam or some other digital download service. It's faster to get the game in the US normally to do that than to drive out to the store and buy it. It's cheaper without taxes. Uh, there's a lot of good things with digital downloads. We all know this. but. There's also a lot of bad things, and that's if the service dies, if they go under, you lose access to it. If you get banned for some reason, maybe not to your own doing, you lose access. If support, you get locked out or hacked, and support sucks, which it does on some of these services, you lose access. So there's a lot of downsides. And then, of course, if you're in another country, or if you're just in the boondocks in the U.S., and you have a slow internet connection, that's a big downside, too, because now you've got to download for a day or more in some cases just to get your game when you could have gone to a store 20 minutes away and come home with it ready to play. So yeah, it's it's an interesting problem to solve. And I think the publishers like Steam and GOG are doing a good job these days. I think the, the actual publishers or developers like Bethesda are, are a little confused still. I am a big fan of having a physical copy of my game on a shelf. And I'm also a fan of having it as a disc that if I, I travel a lot, so if I travel and decide to go somewhere, I can throw it in a bag and install it on whatever system I'm using there. So that is kind of 
a nice thing to have. And if you're in another country, like I'm assuming this question asker is, then it's your internet's a lot slower. So not that the U.S. has fast internet. It's basically a third world country and some of the, some places in the U.S. with the three megabit per second internet, even down the street from me, that's what they have in some places. Uh, so my opinion on it is I suppose that if, if you're going to sell a physical copy of the game, just sell the whole freaking game. Don't don't put half of it on there and then force someone to download the, the game. Um, a lot of games, I can't remember if Total War did this, but a lot of games that I've worked with have been, you buy the box, maybe there's a decorative CD in it, and then there's just a Steam code and you activate that and do the rest from there. So that's kind of silly too. It's just like, why? Uh, it, the industry's confused. They're still catching up. Um, I don't, I, I'm of the opinion that either sell the whole game as a disc or just force people to download it and be honest about it from the get-go that they're going to have to download everything. Now, to Bethesda's credit, they did publicly state that a good portion of the game content would be on the download-only option, uh, even if you buy the disc. So they did at least publicly disclose that, which is good. That's nice of them. But that's about where I stand on that. I don't have a super strong opinion on it to go into in this kind of video. But hopefully that uh, that at least validates some of your own complaints because I am with you on some of those. So that's all for this time. Thanks again for watching, everyone. Leave questions below in the comments and check the Patreon link again if you're not already a backer. Um, come back this week for some more videos. Check out the Sword Coast video. Let me know what you thought of it. It's pretty long, but maybe just watch a few minutes if you have some free time. And that is a deep dive on the game's mechanics. So we spent a lot of time looking at it. I thought, you know what would be fun? is if we do what we do for hardware with games. And I know that a lot of game reviews are shorter, like five minutes, but uh, I, I kind of like doing the spend eight hours doing one thing in the game and then review that one thing very heavily. So that's what we did there. Let me know what you think. That's all for this time. I will see you all next time.